Hi, this is Miss McIntosh here to talk to you today about Afternoons by Philip Larkin. There's Philip Larkin, miserable man with a bunny rabbit. That's how I like to think of him. Um, as ever, I'm going to make sure that we're thinking about exam technique when we think about these poems because we've over annotated our collection. Um, you have to be able to sound brilliant in 20 minutes about any one of these poems. And to do that, you have to mention context and you have to do it in a meaningful way because it's 33% of your mark. I'm sure you're all sick of me saying that by now, but I'm gonna keep saying it because you keep forgetting to include it. In both the single poem analysis and the comparison section, you have to talk about context and it's a third of your mark. On the plus side, that means you can spell lots of things wrong and you won't get penalized. So, same structure every time. Summarize the poem's approach to the theme, put the poem and author in context, and explain why that's relevant. Um, it's not just why is Philip Larkin writing about nature because he's writing in the late 50s and 1960s. That means nothing, right? We need to say how it shapes what he's doing. Say something clever about the title if relevant, very relevant here. Explain the form and structure. People often find that the hardest. Uh, structure, really, if you start at the beginning, go to the middle and work through to the end, talking about tone shift, there you go, bang, you've got your structure points. Form is actually quite easy to talk about once you get your head around what the form of each of these poems is. And here, as you'll see, it's very relevant. It really shapes the way he's approaching the theme. And then the showing off meat and veg part of your exam, you analyse bit of the poetry, you zoom in on language, you talk about particular poetic devices or how they're connoting and symbolizing things. I've said three to four moments, you could probably do up to eight if you were quoting single words embedded in your analysis, but from the beginning, from the middle, and again from the end. So that covers your structure. So let's start with context as ever, because context, what is it kids? 33% of your mark. So our context for Philip Larkin is fairly entertaining. So Philip Larkin is a very famous poet. Um, he's a 20th century modern poet. What we mean by modern, and that's rather precise usage, is he's a 20th century poet, but he's not a contemporary poet, like Karen Ann Duffy or Simon Armitage, who's still publishing and writing now. Okay, so Larkin is, is dead, like Ted Hughes, like Seamus Heaney. Um, and they are huge poets of the mid and second half of the 20th century. Um, why he's famous, and he was really very famous in Britain for that whole second half of the 20th century, is that he is miserable. He is such a famously miserable, cynical old git, right? Um, and so every one of his poems observes human life and, and sees it through this cynical, miserable old git way. There's a lovely line there at the bottom, you can look out of your life like a train and see what you're heading for, but you can't stop the train. Another quotation there. I think writing about unhappiness is probably the source of my popularity, if I have any. After all, most people are unhappy, don't you think? All right, Phil. So he's a librarian and he grows up in Coventry. Then he moves to Hull, University of Hull, where he's a librarian and a working poet for the rest of his life. Never married, famously isolated, on the outskirts of society, looking in. We've got several poets like that, don't we? We've got William Blake, who we've seen in London, not really connected socially to the literary world around him, seeing the world through his own particular way, writing this unpublished, not popular poetry about how the, the visions of the end times he's seeing when he walks through London. Or like Emily Dickinson, who um, suffers from agoraphobia and never leaves her home. So she writes poetry constantly, but it's not published in her lifetime. So that's unlike him. So he's a bit like if Emily Dickinson marketed her, her agoraphobia as her main selling point, that's Ted Hughes, grumpy old man of British poetry. Just how miserable was he? So miserable, so, so miserable. So from Wikipedia, um, his poems are marked by what Andrew Motion calls a very English glum accuracy. Uh, someone else says he's describing the lowered sights and diminished expectations of Britain after the war. And my favorite quotation here, Eric Homburger called him the saddest heart in the post-war supermarket. Um, Wordsworth we've seen with his, his extract from the prelude, loves a bit of daffodils and such, 
does Wordsworth, um, and Larkin said of himself that deprivation, social poverty, was for him what daffodils were for Wordsworth, right? Here's a comparison that the examiners won't expect if you compare the England in Philip Larkin's afternoons with the England of Rupert Brooks's The Soldier. Yeah. If I should die, think only this of me. There's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. And when we get a kind of picture of Rupert Brooks' England, it's all the countryside of Cambridgeshire and swimming and jumping and being a young posh man flouncing through the countryside. Larkins, it is the Midlands, it's industrial towns, it's northern women, and it's the white working class. We'll talk a little bit more about the whiteness of that working class when we get to the next slide. Um, why was he so cynical about human relationships? Well, his parents have messed him up good and proper. Um, he was educated at home until the age of eight. Uh, and so he didn't, friends and relatives didn't come round because they were a terrible, awful family. Um, he didn't have friends. He developed a stammer, he was nervousness. His father, prince of a man, was a nihilist. That means he didn't believe in anything as a philosophical stance. I believe in nothing, nihil from the Latin for nothing. He'd attended two Nazi rallies in the 1930s that he dragged his family along to. So not a nice man. Very domineering. Um, I'm not sure if he was physically violent to Larkin's mother, but he was certainly emotionally violent and coercive. You'd think that would make Philip Larkin sympathise with his mother, but no, not our miserable Phil. He said later that his mother was a nervous and passive woman, a kind of defective mechanism. Her ideal is to collapse and be taken care of by her domineering husband. So the Philip Larkin who writes about the young wives of afternoons is, does not believe in marriage, does not believe in heterosexual performance, does not believe in husbands and wives, doesn't really believe in people, thinks that they are worthless and mechanisms, defective mechanisms that they just go through the motions. So Philip Larkin never marries, stays outside, writes poetry about it instead. Summary there, cynic, outsider, a man perpetually on the sidelines of English life, a man with an eye for detail about the lives of working class and lower middle class people, notably white working class married lives and white working class women. Remember, Philip Larkin, I say, grew up in Coventry and uh, there was a huge amount of West Indian migration to Coventry. Um, while Philip Larkin was beginning to write his poetry, the whole scar scene comes from um, the cultural blending in Coventry, blending the music of Jamaica with, with some of the sounds of the Midlands. You don't see any of that in Larkin. Larkin is writing very much about the traditional working class whose life was one way after the war and then very different afterwards. Think here of an Inspector Cools. So 1945, J.B. Priestley is writing to the nation, the election's coming up, you can choose between Winston Churchill and the Conservative Party and tradition, the upper class where they are, the Eva Smiths where they belong, or we can choose something else entirely, right? We can choose the Labour Party who's offering post-war total radical social reconstruction, the creation of the National Health Service, the creation of the welfare state. Huge amount of Britain has been literally bombed. A huge amount of it is not fit to live in. And a uh, what we see in the post-war period is a complete reconstruction of a huge amount of civic city space, especially in places like Philip Larkin's Coventry that were destroyed by the Blitz. So they build back again and they build back in a way that Philip Larkin has not much time for. He doesn't like it very much. So how does the form and structure reflect the poem's approach to the theme? This is exactly the same as to autumn structurally in some ways. And also, uh, if you break down as imperceptibly as grief, the same there as well. We've got three parts to it. Here we've got three unrhymed stanzas. In um, To Autumn, we have three rhymed stanzas. Visually, what we've got there is a representation of three seasons. Both of them end on winter is coming. That's the theme in all of our nature poems, isn't it? Um, oh no, human life is going to end. Winter is coming three stanzas and we're out when the fourth is finished. Um, how to think about stanzas. Now I got this from uh, Nathaniel Elder in my class. His father is, is a professional poet. And he told us that stanza is Italian for room. 
And that what he thought was helpful is that we should think about when a poet moves between stanzas, it's like they're stepping into a different room with a different atmosphere, different sensory impressions, different set of lighting, different perspective. So what happens when we go between the stanzas, and as we'll see it's quite, it's quite marked what happens when we step between those three different rooms, those three stanzas. So your next part, analyze three to four moments, poem, yeah, moments in the poem about which you can be cleverest, making sure to analyze the beginning and the end as well as something in between. We'll start with the first line, summer is fading. So that's your central metaphor for the poem is the seasons. Um, another central metaphor is the day. Both of them run throughout the poem as they do in Wordsworth's extract from the prelude, Keats is to autumn, Emily Dickens is as imperceptibly as grief, uh, Seamus Heaney's death of a naturalist. It's almost like we've been given the same poem over and over and over again by the exam board, for which we are very grateful. Thank you, exam board. Summer is fading. The leaves fall in ones and twos from trees bordering the new recreation grounds. In the hollows of afternoons, young mothers assemble at swing and sandpit, setting free their children. What I've put in purple here is things I know I can say something about. But I don't actually have time, if we think about this amount of purple over three stanzas, I don't have time to write about all of those things. So if my question was right about the seasons, I'm going to choose different ones here. Um, the leaves fall in ones and twos. As in Manhunt, ones and twos as pairs. This is a poem about romantic coupling um, women in married lives. So ones and twos, they're very symbolic. Um, trees bordering the new recreation grounds. There's your context point. I've put a picture there of a recreation ground. That's exactly the kind of post-war, post-1945 reconstruction of the nation. They thought the working classes need to get out of these overcrowded, industrial, incredibly unhealthy conditions and have healthy minds and healthy bodies. And here's some planned civic spaces that we're offering them. Philip Larkin, no time for it. He thinks it's machinery, just like his mother. You know, a type of defective mechanism. And we see that language of machinery, of military assembly, of a lack of freedom in the little second half of this stanza. Young mothers assemble at swing and sandpit, setting free their children. Assemble is a verb there that comes from either the assembly line in a factory or assemble is something that um, troops do uh, in the parade grounds. So his very cynical view of all the people living in these brand new hygienic houses is that they're just machinery. They've been turned into a vast social mechanism. When their children are released from the housing estate, they're set free to nature. So nature is sort of oppositional to this planned post-war British economy. <laughs> And there we've got some pictures of white working class women from the 50s. Uh, just to give you a sense there of um, some visual ideas of uniformity. Everyone's wearing the same sort of clothes. Everyone's wearing the same hats. Everyone's wearing the same coats. They've got a lack of identity um, in this world where women are staying at home, looking after the children, going about their social routine. I'm using the kind of imagery Philip Larkin would have used. They're just part of the machinery of post-war Britain. They all look the same. They've lost their individuality. Right? Second stanza, behind them at intervals stand husbands in skilled trades, an estate full of washing and the albums lettered our wedding lying near the television. Before them, the wind is ruining their courting places. Their husbands aren't really standing behind them, kids. Okay, This is an extended metaphor, a sort of symbolic vision for how he's seeing this organized mechanical defective mechanism of post-war skilled working class life. The husbands in skilled trades, that's um, well-paid manual labor with, with advanced skills attached to it, like being an electrician, being a plumber. And he doesn't see those as opposed to professional classes, like being a poet or being a lecturer or being a teacher or being a doctor as being acts of individuality. The husbands are standing behind in regular intervals, regular spaces, just as the women assembled. There's an estate full of washing that's talking about what they're doing. But I've put the word estate full in purple there because that's, again, about the planned housing spaces, the new housing built by the Labour government for families to move into. The albums lettered our wedding lying near the television. 
I found very handily um, a, a photo album exactly like that with a picture from exactly the right period. So what he's saying is that every single one of them has the same album symbolically. Every single one of them has the same consumer purchase. Every single one of them has our wedding lying near the television. I'm stressing the word lying there because of course that's a play on words. It's not true, it's a lie. So on simultaneously it's lying down and it's a lie near the television. Now we might let that one go by the television except for where we are and when we are. Televisions, as I'll show you on the next slide, really weren't easy to get. So as you can see from those two pictures on the left, the top one of which could easily be my nan in 1974, the television was an ex incredibly expensive consumer item, um, especially color televisions when they came in. So like, I didn't see a color television and, until I was at least five years old because they just were too expensive for most families. And you have the pictures here, the families posing next to their televisions proudly. Does Philip Larkin think that's a good thing? No, he sees that as all part of the machinery, the commercial defective machinery of modern life. Over there, you can see a planned housing estate with families going about their way. Down there, you can see um, Coventry, Philip Larkin's hometown, the plan for it, the plan for modern living designed after it was completely destroyed in the Blitz. Now you might be getting a sense that I'm being a bit hostile to Philip Larkin. I do love Philip Larkin's poetry, but I'm also aware that he completely, his poetry is about people like my grandparents um, who, who were absolutely impoverished before the Second World War. After the Second World War, they had council houses to move into. They had good union jobs, they had healthcare. And it was a good thing. But for Philip Larkin, he thinks it's all terribly sad and mechanical. Thanks, Phil. And then the last stanza, that are still courting places, but the lovers are all in school and their children, so intent on finding more unripe acorns, expect to be taken home. Their beauty has thickened. Something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. One thing to think about here is what traditionally people used to call marriage, your wedding day, if you were a woman, and still do. You'll recognise it when I say it your big day. It's your big day, your wedding day. And what we don't often think about is what that tells you about every single other day that follows. They're all small days, smaller and smaller and smaller days. Something is pushing you to the side of your own life. In this version of, of women's lives, they live entirely for the courting, the courting places here. And then the big day, the wedding, our wedding. And then after that, they are just diminished. They're pushed to the side of their own lives in the vast machinery of life and death that's churning through um, these working class people's lives. They, they grow up, they get married, they die, their children do the same thing. A um, couple of symbols here, the unripe acorns that the children are picking up. Obviously that's a metaphor for the children themselves. So now we have three extended metaphors. We have the course of the day, because of course it's the afternoon, afternoon symbolism. It's also the course of the year because summer is fading and also it's an oak tree. Uh, so that you start from an acorn, you grow to an oak, you die, you sh you're shedding new acorns, they grow to new oak trees. It's inevitable machinery of nature, life and death are machinery. And that is Philip Larkin's happy, happy view of human life. So here's how I'd approach this in an exam. Summarise the poem's approach to the theme. My same bad joke as always. Apologise to anyone. Apologies to anyone who's listened to the rest of my nature poems because I make the same bad jokes all the time. Winter is coming. Don't say that. It's a joke about Game of Thrones. But every single one of these nature poems does the same thing. Said here: Lower middle class human life and love are transient and meaningless clutter in the face of the unstoppable cycle of life and death. Put the poem and author in context and explain why that matters. Mid 20th century poet Philip Larkin was an outsider to human relations, a never married, isolated librarian whose parents had a difficult marriage. He's pessimistic, not hopeful, and cynical, doesn't believe, about humanity. Um, and then I've put a reference there to a poem called This Be the Verse, which if we were all in class, I'd read you, but it's got a big swear word in it. 
so I'm not going to. But essentially, he says, they F you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. And the last verse there is perfect for understanding Philip Larkin. He says, man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. That's what he did, didn't he? So form and structure and how that reflects the approach to the theme. The poem has three fi fixed stanzas reflecting the three seasons which have passed. The poem ends before the arrival of winter, death, nighttime. Again, same as all the other nature poems. Clever comment about the title. We can absolutely make this one here because afternoons, that's his key pathetic fallacy core metaphor. The central metaphor of the cyclical nature of the seasons is paired with the use of the day as the same metaphor. These are the afternoons before the arrival of night and death, right? So if we go back to Mr. Elder's idea about stanzas being, uh, being rooms, the only room waiting for these women at the end is a waiting room, isn't it? A, a, a shabby waiting room before the inevitability of death with nothing to look forward to, because remember their big day happened when they were aged 18 to 22. And after that, something has just pushed them to the sides of their own lives over and out. Get early as you get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. It's a good thing we didn't all take Mr. Larkin's advice. And that is the end of my Philip Larkin lecture.